1967 Son of Godzilla, directed by Jun Fukuda. Now, when doing research for these videos, there are certain narratives that surround these movies. Some of the first words that come to people's minds when speaking about Son of Godzilla are cheap, childish, cheesy, disturbing. Putting that aside, on a recent rewatch, I realized that this movie might actually be one of my favorites of the Showa era. I know, I'm appalled by this as well. Known as the second of the island movies due to the island setting and lack of intricate miniatures, Son of Godzilla originated when Tomoyuki Tanaka and many at Toho noticed the demographic shift in Godzilla's audience. No longer were adults going to see the King of Monsters, but children were now seen as his biggest fans. Toho also noticed that despite the monster boom, their ticket sales to Godzilla movies continued to wane so the budget would be cut even further for this next film. As explained in the last video, part of that was due to TV's prominence, but also the competition from other movie studios. In 1967, the four major Japanese movie studios would all release a giant monster movie, mainly because the Japanese government was offering loans to movie studios who would make movies like this for export. Unfortunately, some studios, like Nikatsu Studios, would take the loan money but not use any of it on their monster movie. And instead using it to pay off debts. Toho would release both King Kong Escapes and Son of Godzilla in 1967. And then there would be Dai's Gamera vs. Gauss, Nikatsu Studios, Monster from a Prehistoric Planet, and Shochiku Studios, The X from Outer Space. This one had an interesting looking monster named Galala, hoping I pronounced that right. And Prehistoric Planet had monsters called the Gappas that sort of resemble Rodan, and the Hellhawks from Godzilla vs. Kong looked like them as well. South Korea would also get in on the fun, creating Yangari, Monster from the Deep. Though many would criticize the movie for not doing anything different to separate it from the Japanese movies before it. But movie historian Steve Rifle would find something interesting to say about it nonetheless. Symbolically, you could say that the monster represents the South Spheres in those days. It rises up from the ground in the place where the war stopped and resumes fighting, and it swoops down from the north to destroy the city of Seoul all over again. Back in Japan, younger audiences, reduced ticket sales, and smaller budgets would for the most part be the ongoing theme for the rest of the Showa era. The way Rifle tells it, in 1967, Toho prioritized King Kong Escapes over Son of Godzilla, with all the frontline actors and creative talent working on the Kong movie, like Honda, Tsuburaya, and Ifukube, while all the quote-unquote secondary talent was called upon for Son of Godzilla. This included Jun Fukuda as director, Saramasa Arikawa handling special effects, and Masaru Sato composing the score. I have a hard time saying any of these gentlemen are secondary talent, but I understand why Rifle wrote it that way. And of course, Shinichi Sekizawa would write the story and script. Considering the man was tired of writing these movies by this point, it's impressive he managed to write what I think, anyway, is a perfectly paced and entertaining Godzilla movie that stands out despite its budget limitations. This would be the first time Eiji Tsuburaya was not credited as special effects director on a Godzilla movie instead getting ceremonial credit as special effects supervisor. Arikawa first became interested in special effects when he saw the movie, The War at Sea from Hawaii to Malaya, and it was during World War II that Arikawa flew patrols over the Pacific, and after the war he would go directly to Tsuburaya's door to request a job. Luckily for him, Tsuburaya was fascinated with aviation, so the two men bonded over that. Mr. Tsuburaya and I enjoyed talking about planes all night long. Just when Arikawa was going to leave, Tsuburaya asked that he join him. So this movie was a big moment for Arikawa to show everyone what he learned with his name now showing as special effects director in the credits. Sekizawa would get some help this time from his protege, Kazue Kiba. She is the first woman to take a stab at writing a Godzilla movie. In some sources, her name is listed as Kazue Shiba. She had helped Sekizawa before on his 1966 movie Zero Fighter. According to movie historian John LeMay, her first crack at this Godzilla movie was titled Two Godzillas, Japan S.O.S., Tanaka would not like some of the things in the script, and so he handed it off back to Sekizawa to refine and give him a final version. According to Rifle, it was Gamera's appeal to kids that had Tanaka thinking about giving Godzilla a son. 
We wanted to take a new approach, so we gave Godzilla a child. We thought it would be a little strange if Godzilla had a daughter, so instead we gave him a son. Production for Son of Godzilla would take place in the late fall with crews going to Guam and several Japanese areas for shooting. Some would say Toho was just trying to appeal to the quote-unquote date crowd, with the potential of having young women flock to theaters to see the cute baby monster. Well, let's see if Toho's strategy here paid off. The movie opens with a storm, reminiscent of how Mothra vs. Godzilla began. A weather reconnaissance aircraft is flying through when they almost crash into Godzilla, who looks absolutely terrible here. What you're seeing is the Dyson Sogoji suit that they had been using since Invasion of Astro Monster. It's in such bad shape that they would offer it up to the dreaded water scene, so they didn't have to use their brand new suit, which somehow manages to look even worse. It's quite stunning. But hey, a little over a minute into the movie and we're already seeing Godzilla. Maybe Tanaka didn't like that in Ebira Hara of the Deep we had to wait almost 50 minutes before Godzilla wakes up. The men realize that Godzilla is heading directly for Sogo Island, where the rest of this movie takes place. Investigative reporter Goro Maki later parachutes onto the island. Maki is played by Akira Kubo, who we last saw in Invasion of Astro Monster playing the spineless Tetsuo. He plays a much more plucky character in this one. Interestingly, we see the Goromaki namesake used a couple of more times in the Godzilla series. On Sogol Island, there's United Nations scientists led by Professor Kusumi, played by Toho veteran Tadao Takashima. Though Takashima's character is important to the movie, the first member of the team the audience meets is Furukawa helping check one of the towers that the team has set up on the island. Played by the always interesting Yoshio Tsuchiya, Furukawa's character has a slow-burning mental breakdown throughout the movie that is quite entertaining to watch. Tsuchiya once again pulls off a brilliant performance, despite not being in the limelight, or playing an alien. Maki lands on the island in hopes of finding a story to write about. Kasumi and his fellow scientist, Fujisaki, played by Akahiko Harata, no eye patch this time, are pretty rude when they discover the parachuting reporter, telling him he won't be getting any stories out of them. You'll have to go back. That's ridiculous. You're the one that's ridiculous. <laughs> Maki refuses to leave, and so they put him to work instead. This ends up not being such a wise idea. The spiteful Maki later feeds them some lettuce marinated in ball sweat. Probably one of the few times I laughed loudly at an intentional funny human part in one of these movies. We slowly start to see the weird anomalies of the island. For example, larger than normal praying mantis-like creatures stalking the camp. I don't blame Furukawa for losing his shit. If I was on a remote island filled with large insects, I'd bring a flamethrower. The mantis props would have light bulbs inserted into the eyes to give that glow effect. Later, when collecting food, Maki sees a beautiful woman swimming. The woman almost resembles a mermaid in this scene, though the equivalent of a mermaid in Japan is, uh, very interesting. What did I? Anyway, the beautiful woman, who we later learn is named Saeko, is played by Bibari or Beverly Maeda. Maeda had made a name for herself starring in the Young Guy films, but also in 1968 she would appear in Golden Eyes with Akira Takarada. Maeda was involved in the arts at a young age, taking a liking to dancing, and would later join Toho along with modeling for Shisaido Cosmetics, the largest cosmetics company in Japan. Just to put that in perspective on what a big deal that was, a more modern example would be be Nana Komatsu, who also modeled for the company in recent years. I normally don't spend time on how the women look in these early movies, but I'll be real for a second here. If I had a show era waifu, it's Saeko. We learn later in the movie that when she was young, she had lived on Sogol Island with her father, who was a researcher. Unfortunately, he died seven years prior to the start of the film, so she's just been stuck and surviving on her own ever since. We also learn that Professor Kasumi's team is there conducting weather experiments. The reason being the United Nations hopes to be able to grow food anywhere in the world, as they fear overpopulation will consume too many resources. It's funny how years later this concept still gets used today in many prominent works. Kasumi's team conducts an experiment involving radiation of some sort, but it prematurely explodes in the air due to radio interference that has been hampering them since being on the island. The premature explosion causes an extreme heat wave on the island along with radioactive storms. The result after a few weeks 
even bigger and now irradiated praying mantises, nicknamed Kamakuras by Maki. The Kamakuras are able to fly and bludgeon things with their claws. The name comes from the Japanese word Kamakiri, which means mantis. The giant praying mantis was modeled by Nobuyuki Yasumoru. Yasumoru worked on Toho projects since the early 1960s and would go on to model some of the most notorious monsters in Japanese movie history over the next 30 years. In the 60s, he was not an official Toho employee, but he had been contracted to work on 1961's Mothra. He would help create the realistic Shibuya neighborhood that the Mothra larva destroys, specifically the Tokyo department store. For Kamakuris, no suit actors would be needed and the marionettes would be made out of wood. And those dangerous looking claws were just as scary on set as they were crafted with iron. The crew would create nine props of different sizes to show the different perspectives. We built joints into the body so we could move it in different ways. We attached wires to several points on the monsters. There were two points on the claws where wires would be attached, one at the back and one at the front of the claw. There were also wires at the leg joint and where the body and leg meet. While heading to one of the towers, Maki and Morio, played by Kenji Sahara, encounter multiple Kamakuras and proceed with caution. It's here we see them breaking open a large egg. The men deduce it was this egg that must have been causing the radio interference. Inside the egg, we see a baby Godzilla calling for its parent. The newborn looks quite... Disturbing. This was a roughly two foot long model being used and the body would be moved using wires. The body would have to be repositioned a bunch, so you will notice the camera does a lot of quick cuts when he's on screen because he kept falling over. John LeMay points out that maybe this premature birth is why Manila never grows up. We see him next in Destroy All Monsters, which is supposed to take place about 40 years or so after this movie, and he looks the same. Personally, I think it's more likely that Toho accidentally forgot that Minya should have grown, but who knows. The Kamakuras show their cruel nature, seemingly torturing the youngling as we get some disgusting close-up shots of their mandibles. Just when it seems like the baby is going to be killed, we cut to Furukawa, brandishing a gun and having a complete breakdown. He then runs to the shore. Until he sees Godzilla, then he immediately runs back inland. He'll take his chances with the giant bugs. What's kind of forgotten in this movie is how cutthroat and cold Professor Kasumi and his group of scientists are at times. Furukawa may seem nuts, but earlier in the film, Fujisaki lets the professor know that he broke all the radios on the island leaving the scientists no choice but to stay and do their job. These characters aren't exactly all noble. The ends justify the means for Fujisaki and Professor Kasumi, despite them being the good guys. Godzilla coming ashore was quite the mini-project itself. Playing Godzilla while in the Daisen Sogoji suit was Haru Nakajima, and he described the ordeal as arduous, as being underwater required a mouthpiece and an oxygen tank that weighed about 20 pounds to be located in the midsection of the Godzilla suit. I had a crew place a movable cart underwater because it was so heavy it would not move an inch. I was holding on to the cart while I was standing by underwater. My back fins were barely above the surface. They tied a rope to my foot and pulled on it when the camera started to roll because I couldn't hear if they yelled action above the water. I was pulled by this heavy-duty vehicle, like a jeep. When I knew it was time to rise out of the water, I used all my energy to spring out, but the water pressure was tremendous and the mouthpiece was about to fall out of my mouth. It was a pain in the neck. The opening scene and Godzilla coming ashore here would be Nakajima's only scenes. This brings us to the new and possibly worst Godzilla suit of all time. The Musuko Goji suit's face is the most off-putting feature, giving him a pug-like nose and bulging eyes. The neck was much longer as well. The suit itself was bigger than any Godzilla suit made at the time, and that meant Nakajima was too small to play the role. Instead, former baseball player Seiji Onaka was cast to be Godzilla. Onaka was a bigger guy, for you, and he had been in numerous extra roles before this. Unfortunately, during filming, he would break a couple of fingers, and so Nakajima's good friend and fellow Frankenstein spawn monster, Hiroshi Sakita, would step in to play the role. They made this Godzilla so massive and the neck so long to create contrast between the parent monster and his son. The face was even modeled differently to resemble the young kaiju. So you can blame Minya for why Godzilla looks so bad. 
Godzilla arrives to save the youngster, but the three Kamakuras don't back down, and one even cartoonishly puts its leg over the baby. The Kamakuras fly into action, and the wire work for them and the eventual big bad of the movie is generally praised by critics. Godzilla body slams one of the insects like he's a professional wrestler. Maki even mentions wrestling while observing. Pro wrestling has been a big hit in Japan for a long time. Another one leaps at Godzilla who dodges and lights it up. The two remaining Kamakuras play a little awkward game with the boulder before this happens. And that's the second time I laughed loudly while watching this movie. As the battle continues, there are some unfortunate moments. You can quickly see the studio setup as the camera pans upward. This is not something you want happening in a professionally made movie, of course. Godzilla continuously slams the shit out of one of the insects to the point where its limbs are coming off and even the baby is horrified. The big guy then finishes the insect off. Though the atomic breath was of course animated in, the insect prop would really be lit on fire. The remaining mantis wisely flees, while Godzilla accidentally smacks the baby with his tail. After saving the day, he walks away. Sayako then calls to the young kaiju using her hands to make some crazy-ass sound that is more haunting than anything. No idea how that's possible. The jolly music from the beginning of the movie starts to play as Sayako feeds the baby Godzilla, and it doesn't look convincing. It's obvious Maeda is looking at a giant screen or projection, but besides that, it's a cute moment. The song accompanies the baby Godzilla throughout the rest of the movie, and as Brian Solomon notes, it sounds suspiciously like Henry Massini's Baby Elephant Walk. They quickly use a doll to portray Sayako, and luckily it isn't on camera long. Godzilla comes back to retrieve his son, and the little one even gets a lift. The next time we see the two, the infant looks a little different now. This is the look that most of us know him by, Manila, or Minya. The kaiju is a member of the Godzilla family. At the start of the movie, he can't do much on his own other than scream for his dad or fire smoke rings. Some of the roars for Minya are recycled noises from the giant condor from Ebira Hara of the Deep. It is never clearly confirmed whether the Godzilla in this movie is the biological father or not. Though I'll point out that the 1998 book, the official Godzilla compendium, it states that Minya was adopted by Godzilla. In Kiba's original screenplay, Minya would be named Godzilla Jr. and would be 30 meters in height and have blue coloring. He'd also be destroying parts of Japan with Godzilla, a far cry from what we get. The name Manila was not chosen until production was already ongoing. He was named Childzilla in the script, and Toho even held a naming contest that drew over 8,000 suggestions before Manila was chosen during a naming ceremony party with all the film stars attending. The name Manila is just a combination of the words Mini and Gojira. Suit designer Teizo Toshimitsu would model Manila's face off Chibita from the manga Osumatsu-kun. This manga really had an impact on some of the early decisions of the Godzilla series. The man playing Minya was Masao Fukuzawa, or Little Man Machan, and apparently it was no easy go. The suit wasn't a perfect fit, so Fukuzawa kind of wobbled around, which Arikawa was fine with because it resembled how a toddler walks. Obviously, his size was a prerequisite for the job, but his ability to perform athletic moves in a rubber suit made him a shoo in Fukuzawa was a professional wrestler, entertainer, and he would go on to play Manila or Minya in Destroy All Monsters and All Monsters Attack. He even made an appearance in the notorious North Korean kaiju film Pulgasari, playing the younger version of the monster. We're gifted with some pretty funny scenes between Godzilla and Minya. Minya tries playing jump rope with Godzilla's tail, and Godzilla's like, oh, that boy ain't right. Another scene shows Godzilla dragging Minya by the tail after the little one has a temper tantrum. He really doesn't want to put up with this shit. You can just sense Ishiro Honda somewhere being very annoyed at this whole thing. Later on, Saiko encounters Maki, and as the movie goes along, the two become close, with Maki later introducing her to the group of scientists. She even helps the men, allowing them to move their base of operations to her cave because their base got destroyed by Godzilla. She also lets them know of a boiling lake filled with red water that can cure the Solgil fever afflicting them. 
The only problem, they need to head past Kumanga's Valley. What's Kumanga? A giant spider. My worst enemy. Maki jokes that this place should be named Monster Island. He's one movie early with that line. Saiko leads Maki there. They don't encounter Kumanga, but they instead find Godzilla teaching Minya the fine art of kaijuing, a class on roaring, and then on how to use the monster's most famous ability. Originally, Arikawa requested the small Godzilla's atomic breath curve vertically into the air, until Tsuburaya advised smoke rings would be better. Godzilla's parenting style can be described as tough love, but even the tough dad congratulates his son when he does well. Scenes like this were Fukuda's idea of wanting to portray the monster to be somewhat human-like. We focused on the relationship between Godzilla and his son throughout the course of Son of Godzilla. Later in the film, Godzilla and Minya cross paths with Kamakuris again. During their fight, a boulder gets kicked into Kumanga Valley, awakening the sleeping kaiju. Kumanga is a giant spider native to Sogol Island. I don't know if the radiation from the weather experiment affected the monster, but we learned from Saiko's father's notes that he knew of the giant spider all the way back then. Art director Yasuyuki Inoue would design the 16-foot Kumanga prop that was operated by almost 20 people using piano wires from the ceiling. The folks operating the wires would be on a beam above the set near the studio lights, which of course was hot, so their sweat would fall onto the set during shooting. The name Kumanga comes from the Japanese word for spider, kumo, though in English dubs his name gets changed. And on the way, you must pass the spiga. Reiko, just what is the spiga? It's a giant spider. Also in that area is another monster called a spiga. Spiga? Just what sort of monster is that? A huge, ugly spider. It's dangerous. Kumanga sees our main characters and begins chasing them and shooting its webbing. It shoots the web from its mouth rather than the end of its abdomen, like most spiders. A small mechanism in the mouth of the prop was built to shoot the same material used for Mothra's silk. Maki and Saiko escape Kumanga using fire. In Saiko's dad's notes, it said that the webbing can only be destroyed with heat. Though it does look a little comical when Maki is using this small lighter to set them free from all that web. A full-size Kumanga leg model was made for the parts where it tries to grab the humans. Ugh. It's kind of interesting how I find spiders to be so gross, but Ebira, which is a shrimp or lobster, looks pretty similar to a spider. They're basically just spiders underwater, but it doesn't bother me at all. Some of the best editing occurs when Kumanga is on the move. The combination of Saiko's dad's notes and Kumanga's opening scene is a good way of building him up to a monster that might be an even match for Godzilla. Kasumi proposes using his weather contraption again to freeze the monsters so they can all escape. Fujisaki is able to make radio contact with the UN who send a submarine to pick them up, all thanks to Maki and Saiko setting up an antenna. Poor Minya is just walking along, and then, oh my There's so many moments in this movie that made me think, this is my worst nightmare. The scene is shot from the miniature tree line, and then bam, it switches to Minya's perspective. I think that was nicely edited. Even though I really, really hate everything about that at the same time. As the others escape to the shore to get on a lifeboat, poor Minya is left to fight Kumanga on its own, and it isn't looking good. Kamakuris stumbles upon all this and is like, yeah, I'm not getting involved in this crap, but Kumanga says not so fast. We even see the giant spider use its venomous stinger to kill Kamakuris instantly. A nice touch was having the lights go out of the eyes of Kamakuris. The scientists detect Minya's radio waves calling for his dad, but Professor Kasumi is once again just so cold, retorting that once the radio interference clears up, that means Minya is dead or just gave up calling his dad. They really don't care about the little guy. With Minya seemingly all but done for, Godzilla shows up and the final battle begins. This ending fight would take two days to film because manipulating every step Kumanga made was extremely challenging, with the puppet needing two to three people to work each leg. One of the grossest parts is when they show a close-up of Godzilla's eyes, then back to Kumanga's mouth, 
and so forth. Godzilla catches a stinger in the eye and is now fighting with impaired vision. The humans by this point have escaped out to sea, and they all look like Santa Claus for some reason, and Professor Kasumi finally gets to see his experiment work. They all witness the island begin to freeze and snow begins to fall. Even Furukawa, who only wanted to get off that damn island, is happy for the professor, snapping out of his madness. Interesting that despite the weather control experiment causing the issue in the first place, it's the same device that saves the day in the end. David Callip points out that in most American monster movies, the scientists would have learned their lesson to be satisfied with the status quo. Instead, this movie says screw that, keep researching, and try again. Now with the snowy ambiance, Godzilla and Manila continue their fight to the death with Kumanga. And just like the stormy setting for Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster, I've always found this battle to just look awesome. I must be really easy to please. Just add some weather effects and I'll think it's the coolest thing ever. I'd always do that in football video games too. To have the snow blow like that, they were using industrial fans, but what was the snow itself made of? I have no idea. I couldn't find anything. But when looking, I found out that movie sets have a pretty crazy history of how they imitated snow. Some even used asbestos before the world realized the danger. Funny enough, my first time watching this movie as a kid, it was snowing outside, and I turned it on right when this fight started. So I had no context for anything going on, and I didn't give one shit. Godzilla was fighting a giant spider, and for some reason he had a child, but who cares? It just matched the mood of that day. We then get Bill's nightmare scenario number 100. Kumanga now completely gets on top of Godzilla. Ugh. Luckily, Minya, in a big moment, can now use his atomic breath successfully and helps his dad out. Godzilla and the giant spider then have a clash of projectiles, and because the webbing can't stand up to the heat, it's no match for the atomic breath. After getting a direct hit on Kumanga despite only having use of one eye, Manila joins in for one of the most wholesome father-son combo attacks ever. The father-son atomic breath finishes off the giant spider, leaving behind an arachnid barbecue. The father-son duo then begin to leave, but Minya falls as he's not strong enough to deal with the weather. Godzilla initially seems to abandon his son before going back and picking his son up and embracing him. Initially, the scene has Godzilla making it all the way to the shore before turning back. A part of this can be seen in the movie's trailer. The scene is about as touching and wholesome a moment a Godzilla movie can have. Decades later, Toho would even have a snow globe made depicting this touching shot. Just as we think the movie is about to end, Ebira returns. No, I'm just joking. It's the UN submarine that's there to pick everybody up. As Saiko takes one last look at her old home and waves goodbye, the movie then ends. Another movie where we have our main cast escaping an island before it's destroyed, or in this case, made uninhabitable. This movie has the man versus nature theme that the original Godzilla movie had, with scientists creating something that accidentally causes a disaster. And just like the original movie, this movie fixes the scientific mishap with more science. The difference being, the original Godzilla had Sarazawa sacrificing his life to save the day, thus giving the original a little bit more of an emotional impact. But in this story, nothing is sacrificed. No lessons are learned, and we're even reminded, twice, that don't worry, Godzilla and his son will be okay, and will now just hibernate. Imagine how much more powerful this scene might have been if we were told that Godzilla and his son were going to die, or we were at least left unsure. That obviously wouldn't fly with the movie's target audience, though. Instead, we simply just get a happy ending with everybody getting what they wanted. Saiko gets to leave the island she'd been stuck on since her father died, as does Furukawa. The scientists get to successfully use their weather device. Maki gets a story to write and falls in love. Manila gets a father, and Godzilla learns the joys of parenting. And I got what I wanted, a fun, touching movie where a giant spider gets defeated by my favorite fictional character. A modern movie that this film sort of reminded me of was Kong Skull Island. You even have the guy trapped on the island coming home at the end, just like Psycho. As I mentioned previously, Minya and the idea of Godzilla having a child would carry on throughout the years. 
Manila or Minya himself was never well received amongst Western audiences, but has always been relatively popular in Japan, much to my surprise. Kumanga would appear and be referenced in further Godzilla media, and in 2020, archaeologists would name a new species of spitting spiders, Cytotes kumanga, after the kaiju. Just like kumanga, it uses its mouth rather than its abdomen to shoot webbing. Beverly Maeda wouldn't appear in another Godzilla movie. However, she would later be cast in Japanese productions of Gone with the Wind, West Side Story, and Les Mis. Son of Godzilla was released December 16, 1967, and would sell only about 2,480,000 tickets. In the U.S., the movie would once again bypass theaters and go straight to television. Like I said at the start, I like this movie. I know it gets a lot of hate, but it just works for me. I just wish the Godzilla suit was better, and though I'm not a big fan of Godzilla having a child, especially one that looks like this, I thought it was a fun little thing they did, and Fukuda executed it as well as he could. It just didn't pay off in terms of ticket sales. This, along with television becoming more popular, led Tanaka to conclude that it was time to end the Godzilla series. So what was to be Godzilla's final movie would also be a celebration of some of Toho's most famous giant monsters. Next up is 1968's Destroy All Monsters. 